by at about uh, 6 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Kind of reminded of when I was an adjunct accounting professor at UL because we got empty seats in the front of the class. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, if, if you don't want to stand and you want to seat, there are, there are some seats up here. Um, what a great, great response. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your evening. We all have families and, and, and busy lives, and so I appreciate uh, everybody that's here tonight and, uh, and helping to spread the word. So thank you for that. One, you know, when I took, when I took the oath of office, um, a, lot of, a lot of times what we, what we do is we go in and we start looking at all the different departments and I meet with public works or I go over the books and I, I try to figure out what are we doing, um, what can we do better, and I may tell, I may tell planning and zoning that look, we, we need to be a little bit more you know, reasonable. We need to, to, to work to be a little more consistent with folks. We gotta provide better customer service. When I look at the budget, uh, I take the same approach and say, right, what, what things are we doing good? Um, where might we make some improvements? And so uh, I was fortunate during the campaign um, to, to have someone reach out to me, one person, via email. I don't remember. Don Magnum. Don Magnum. Don Magnum. <laughs> Sent an email and said, I'd like to visit with you about um, the situation that exists with pets in our community. And that one meeting has brought us here today. So I don't want anyone to think that one person can't make a difference. <laughs> I, uh, so from that, you know, I began to learn everything that I could. Um, I'm by no means an expert at all in animal control. Um, and that's why I enlisted the help of this incredible organization. That's a national organization and they'll tell you a lot more about themselves. They're pro bono down here without government having to pay anything um, to present to us some ideas and how we can be better. And uh, I haven't run into one person in this community that had an idea of what they thought we should do that was coming up with that, with that idea to make our community worse. I may not agree with the idea, but everyone that approached me came sincerely to say, well, if we did this, we did this, and that's not just related to animal control. I'm talking about across the board and everything. And so I try to keep as open a mind as possible. I try to be as good a listener as possible. And I try to figure out ways that as government, we can do things better in whatever area it is that government has a role. Um, Target Zero, to me, uh, is certainly something, an organization that I'm thrilled is here to help us analyze our situation and make recommendations to us as where we might be able to do better. So I would ask everyone in here um, to keep an open mind. I may agree, I may disagree, some of you may agree, may disagree, but ultimately I think it's the right step forward. I think the opportunities that we have are going to make Lafayette more reflective of who we are as it relates to how we treat our animals. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Pisano, who is here from Target Zero. Thank you so much for making the trip down, and I appreciate you, you taking time out of your Thank schedule. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we get started, I want to introduce Melissa Lapani here with us from Best Friends. No, oh, just hello. 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 Okay, there we go. <laughs> I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I'm with Best Friends Animal Society. We are the nation's only um, animal welfare organization that is exclusively dedicated to ending the killing of dogs and cats in our nation's shelters. Um, we also partner with more than 1,300 rescue groups, animal control agencies, and shelters nationwide, many of whom are right here in this room. Um, I, I cover the state of Louisiana. I live in Utah, but this is, I consider, a second adopted home to me. It's my second trip here since April, and I'm so impressed with the community of Lafayette and all of the people here in this room that are so dedicated to helping save lives and help um, helping the community's homeless pets. So 
Thank you all so very much. I'm really excited to be here working alongside Target Zero, and I, I think you'll all be very interested in what they have to say. So thank you. Um, this year, they're um, down to about 26, I think, right? So Cameron spent six years there um, and creating, implementing, implementing, and managing a lot of the programs that we teach. So when we come to you, we come with that experience. I've been in animal welfare over 25 years. I'm a Cornell University Veterinary School graduate. And out of vet school, after my internship, I worked at North Shore Animal League on Long Island. Who knows about North Shore Animal League? So those of you who don't, North Shore Animal League is financially unlimited, essentially. When the years I was there, the budget was about $50 million um, because of their successful um, investments over the years. And this was a limited admission shelter, 40,000 animals a year. And so when animals were left at our shelter, whether it was in a box in the parking lot, or someone was surrendering their pet, or somebody brought a, a stray pet to us, um, we treated it for anything. And that might have been a brain tumor, cancer, a broken leg, coronavirus, whatever. So we were financially unlimited in our hospital that only um, treated the shelter animals. So here's Dr. Pisano. This is awesome! Animal welfare is great! Like, we get these animals left with us, and we just fix them and get them adopted, and people swarm to North Shore to adopt even the, um, those hard-to-place pets and sick pets with chronic <coughs> diseases because North Shore would pay for their medical care for the rest of the pet's life at our hospital. So this was my introduction to animal welfare. I escaped the Northeast and the cold and moved to Florida because of the weather and um, started to work at an open admission nonprofit shelter handling about 30,000 animals a year um, and euthanizing not just for space but for an upper respiratory infection or um, vomiting or skin disease. And I'm here to tell you um, that that brought me to my knees. It was a turning point in my career because it really was the first time that I realized this is the reality. 30,000 animals going into a shelter and not everybody getting out alive and euthanizing for an upper respiratory infection. I mean, you can't imagine what we treated at North Shore. So I felt that I had to make a decision. Did I want to live behind a limited admission shelter that could do everything? Or did I want to be in an open admission shelter where more of the animals and most of the animals in a community were going and therefore at risk of euthanasia? 
And so I have dedicated my career to open admission shelters. I was also a public shelter director. I had 124 staff, enforcement, rewrote ordinances. I did all of that. So I come to Target Zero with experience and with Karen's experience with these skill sets having to do with everything we teach. So we're here to tell you that these things work, number one, these strategies work, and um, it's because we have been through it. We've been where you sat, it, especially if you work in a shelter. So my disclaimers are sometimes when we give this presentation, people think that we work only with limited admission shelters. But in fact, our goal is to help as many open admission shelters as possible. These principles are the same for open or limited admission. An open admission shelter could be public or it could be private. And that means that all the animals brought to the shelter are accepted into the shelter regardless of the outcome potential, meaning adoption, reclaim, euthanasia, etc. A limited admission shelter is always private. So that board of directors could choose to take in all the animals that come to them or choose to take only ones that they think they can adopt or whatever their policies may be, but they have that option as a limited admission shelter. The other thing is there is a section on cats. So sometimes people think Target Zero only helps um, cats. But we are, in fact, equal opportunity, and we love dogs just as much as we love cats. But you'll see why um, we have an entire <coughs> section on cats. So our story starts in Jacksonville, Florida. And back in 2002, very bad conditions at Animal Control and the Nonprofit Humane Society that was also, at the time, open admission. Those groups were fighting. When there was news media coverage, it was always bad. So the public only knew negative things about the shelters. There was constant turnover in major leadership positions, like animal control in the mayor's office. There was constant turnover. So what happened really essentially between around 2008, um, things started looking up. But this is where the magic happened. Three directors three leaders in that community said, we're sick and tired of being sick and tired, and I'm the spay-neuter clinic director. <coughs> that's, you know, that's what I do, I'm nonprofit. The other one said, I'm the public open admission shelter director. And the other one said, I'm the, the private limited admission, I'm sorry, open admission at the time, shelter director, right? So we all have different backgrounds. We have different, um, ways of operating. But we're going to come into this room and leave every one of those differences outside of this room. And when we walk into this room, we're only going to have two goals. We're going to decrease shelter intake and we're going to get to 90% live outcome. And when we're behind closed doors, we can disagree. We can even raise our voices, although we don't recommend that. But we're going to talk about these things. So when we go out and talk to the media or the public, we have one message. And one message only. And that's what happened. And so when we come to Lafayette Parish, or we go to Las Vegas, or Bakersfield, or Idaho, or Pennsylvania, people say, you know, it's different here because the animal welfare groups don't work together. Duh, really? That's everywhere. And in those communities, their community is not at 90% or better life outcome because people can't get along. So check it at the door and start working together for those common goals. And that's how you're going to get there. And when we say get to 90%, it doesn't count if you're a limited admission shelter. It counts if everybody in the community and your open admission public shelter is at 90%. So that's what we consider the success. So um, when we talk about 90% plus, we're talking about um, a goal that we know is achievable, um, but there will always be euthanasia. 
because there are large, non-rehabilitatable, uh, aggressive dogs that can't safely be placed, so that would be a euthanasia population. You might have neonates that, yeah, and you don't have any foster homes, you might have some euthanasia there, and then you might have medical cases that regardless of your resources, you can't save. So you'll have some euthanasia, but we do know and we are seeing shelters, even large shelters, get to uh, greater than 90%. So here's what happened in Jacksonville. In 2002, almost 34,000 animals were going into those shelters, both open admission, and only 30% were getting out alive. And then something else interesting happened between 13, or here, 1, 2, and 13, 14. The, the Humane Society was open admission. They had also, they had an animal control officer. And when this coalition got together, they said, you know what? We're going to look at every dollar. We're going to look at every job duty, every task, everything that we do must decrease intake or increase live outcome. And guess what? If it doesn't, if it's not under those two criteria, we're not doing it. So they became limited admission, focusing on pulling from the open admission shelter. And then if they could, they would help other um, communities or take in um, owner surrenders. So we got down to that in 13, 14, um, uh, Cameron, how much of that was animal control this year? It was like 11. Like 11, 11. So this far, about 11,000 was animal Actually, control. 13,000. 13,000, that's what I thought. 13,000 was an, um, animal control, and the balance was the Humane Society. But look at that life outcome. 90% better, um, going on several years now. And then you might say, but wait, what happened? Are they failing? They increased intake. That's a self-imposed intake and increase, an increase in intake at the Humane Society because they have rippled out and, and are able to help open admission shelters. Um, there are um, rarely puppies or small dogs at the open admission shelter. Um, they rarely have cats in their shelter. And um, they are left then with, in Jacksonville, most of the dogs that are in the shelter and getting adopted are your pit bull mixes. And coincidentally, um, the open admission shelter live outcome is in the mid-90s, and it's a little bit higher than the limited admission humane society, which is kind of weird, you know? But remember, you're pulling harder. As you get closer to 90, you're dealing with harder cases, you know, some medical and things like that that need a little extra attention. But in any event, this is how Target Zero started way back when. We've been in development for probably four years or so, I guess, maybe five. And then we've been doing assessments for two and a half. Um, and we started as a program of First Coast No More Homeless Pets, but we're now our own charitable initiative. And we um, focus on open admission shelters all over the country and teaching them these strategies and other best practice strategies that we know work. So we have all kinds of fancy information now um, that we do, fancy studies that we didn't have even 10 years ago. So it's a really exciting time in animal welfare. So we do what's called fellowships. We do shelter assessments. And then um, if we feel that the leadership will, um, will come on board and implement these best practices, then we do offer up to a three-year fellowship. And that's all pro bono. We don't charge for any of our services because we're very fortunate to have a wealthy benefactor who made this his mission. And so we, um, we get to help shelters all over the country. And Waco, Texas, we love to talk about because they have a 30% poverty rate. They're about the same size as your parish, um, but twice um, the national average. Your poverty rate is right about the national average here in this parish. Waco at 30% was like, oh, thanks so much, but you know, it's not gonna work here. These strategies aren't gonna work here because we are so poor, and we said, we think they're gonna work, and you should listen to us. And they were saving about 34% of the animals when we started with them. 
And in 1415, they ended at over 89% light outcome. Indianapolis, um, a shelter that was used in euthanizing many, many thousands of cats, um, just ended their last fiscal year at 89 plus percent um, live outcome for cats. In Huntsville, Alabama, we got them to over 90, or 90 um, from 68 percent in just one year. And then these are some other communities that we're working in, we're um, just getting started in El Paso, and just yesterday passed some great legislation there because we help with ordinances as well. You are all welcome to go. All this information is on our website at target-zero.org. This is our um, pyramid of strategies. And this you can think about um, this as pieces of a puzzle. We chose to do a pyramid because we like to talk about the foundation. So the foundation is starts with your public policy, like your stray holds, and how those affect the shelter. We do love um, automatic funding, like a licensing differential between intact and sterilized pets, but automatic funding for these programs to help um, decrease intake and increase life outcome, but the public-private partnerships are crucial because we can't solve this animal welfare problem um, by just depending on the government, that's for sure, and then we can't depend on just nonprofits it needs to be a collaboration. And then things like mandatory identification and licensing that help that ticket home if dogs and cats do end up in shelters. The next level is shelter policies. So you could have ordinances that aren't restricting you, but your shelter policies that you do have control over are providing barriers, um, whether it is to intake or live outcome. We have to know where we're starting. We have to know what our trends are. And if I'm a donor, certainly I want to know, or if I'm anybody who's um, looking at the numbers and, and deciding on a program, I need to know if I'm going to spend X amount of money, what will the impact be? So we absolutely have to depend on accurate data and trends. And that helps us with population management, because the name of the game is trying to help as many animals stay out of the shelter through some things we're going to talk about later, and then if they do have to enter the shelter, get them through to live outcome as soon as possible. The shelter is no place for a pet. Um, I'm not sure who came up with this idea, you know, 100 years ago to warehouse animals, um, but it's not a good environment for pets. Every day in a shelter is, and we, we have no, um, as hard as we work to keep our shelters clean, it's not possible it's like to um, prevent all the infectious disease in a shelter, just like having kids in a daycare. So as a veterinarian, people say, Dr. Rosano, how do I keep the shelter pets healthy? I say keep them out of the shelter, because that's the only answer. There's no magic vaccine um, or no magic cleaner. It's the volume of animals that we have in our shelters that um, really, um, make that infectious disease control impossible to um, prevent 100%. And then certainly when, we, when people come to our shelters, is it a welcoming environment? Is there customer service? Thank you so much for coming. Please look around and see you know, who you might want to adopt. Are we helping our adopters? Are we trying to return owners or return pets in the field? Things like that. We found traveling around the country that a lot of shelters make these blanket, impactful policies based on a fear of an exception that happened probably in 1978 from like three directors ago, and that's a really bad thing that happened. But we made a policy that's affecting tens of thousands of animals based on an exception and something that we fear. So we need to stop doing that, and we need to say, how can I affect, in a positive way, the most animals? We're always going to have issues. We always, everyone in here can give us an example of something bad that happened. We know that. Um, but we're here to save the most. And we're here to say, look at our policies from a global perspective. And we want to try to save the most. So we have to really be paying quick, very close attention to that. 
I mentioned First Coast, um, the spay neuter clinic in Jacksonville, and really um, most of those surgeries I would consider targeted. Um, some are not, you don't have to qualify as fixed income, but we do know that the greatest and most impactful way to decrease intake, hands down, every time, everywhere, is subsidizing that fixed income pet owner. Um, for the spay-neuter surgery. And when we say subsidize, we mean as close to free as possible. And we see a tipping point of over $20 is not accessible. And when we do that, shelter intake decreases. This, um, these are clients that um, really want to do the right thing. They want to spay-neuter their pets, but it's not an option for them. So these are not clients that would ever see a private veterinarian. Um, that is not um, something that's accessible to them. So this is to assist them. And the reason this is so impactful is because studies show, and Peter Marsh is one of our, our co-founders who's written books and done the studies that show that most of the animals left in our open admission shelters are done so by fixed income pet owners and that's why you see the decrease in shelter intake. So the other really important group is large dogs, right? So everybody in here knows, man, if they enter the shelter, it's exponentially harder to place them than the Fufu 10-pound dog. They have larger litters. They're less likely to be sterilized, although most animals entering our shelters are not sterilized. Um, and then obviously your high intake areas. Okay, so we also know from um, the research that we need to do about five of those subsidized surgeries per thousand people, and in your parish, that would be about 1,200 a year, 600 cats, 600 dogs. We do, um, we do feel it is absolutely crucial to qualify people as fixed income because Quite frankly, I mean, we love spay-neuter and we want everybody to spay-neuter, but we don't want somebody that just wants a deal. We want to get, capture that population of people that really want to do the spay-neuter but cannot do it without assistance. So here's what happened in Jacksonville, and if you can, there's some other screens over here, but this, um, up in 2008, this was a spay-neuter program in the community and veterinarian, private veterinarians were helping with surgeries. The demand was just too great and the veterinarians really encouraged them to build a clinic. And so that's what happened and that's why the number of surgeries went up so much. But as you can see, the more surgeries that were done, there's an inverse, direct inverse correlation and intake and euthanasia, oh, there's two lines going down. This is Indianapolis. They have an amazing high volume spay neuter clinic in their community. And so again, you can see the middle line is spay neuter. And you can see the same trend with decreasing intake and euthanasia. This is Waco, Texas. Now they had a, they've had um, a low cost clinic there for a while. But at the end of 2012, the city did designate $100,000 just for fixed income. And so then you see the drastic decrease, um, even more so with intake and euthanasia. And this is, whoops, this is repeatable everywhere. This is Huntsville, Alabama. The only thing that changed here since 2008 is one woman, right, the power of one, started a nonprofit to fund only income targeted spay neuter. They don't have a high volume clinic, so this is all done through the local private veterinarians who are subsidized and paid for those surgeries. And about 2,000 of those surgeries are done every year. That one woman took the city, she has nothing to do with the city shelter, mind you, but her program took that city shelter from over 10,000 animals a year to under 5,000 a year, and they're still going down. So we see when there's some hiccups in funding, we actually see the intake go up when, when that happens in certain places. But this works, um, and it is an absolute, um, I just think it's a no-brainer to invest this little bit of money 
to decrease intake. And let's just talk about cost of care and what happened in Jacksonville going from 34,000 animals to down to 16, going from 10,000 plus down below five. Talk about savings on cost of care. So instead of, why are we on this hamster wheel? We're just round and around, spending money trying to save animals and spending money euthanizing animals. None of us want to do that. We need to stop and look at the other side. And we need to be serious about those strategies that keep animals out of shelters. And this is not about um, closing the door and saying, we're not going to help you. Go find your own way. OK, now some of you, community cat diversion, this might be a new idea or concept. And I'm going to tell you that when I was public shelter director and Cameron started this program in Jacksonville in 2008, I was like, what are you doing? And I don't agree with it. And look at me now. I'm the preacher, right? So sit back, relax, and just have an open mind about the facts. We didn't have this information before in the last you know, 10 or 20 years. We have studies that show that outside cats are seven to ten times more likely to find their way home or find, you know, adopt a home um, from the street than a shelter. We know that people don't reclaim their cats in shelters. Lafayette Parish is no different than the last, you know, two and a half years of shelters. Large shelters that we visited have been, the reclaim rates for cats have been 0.01% or less, okay? We also know that when we trap and euthanize cats and ignore the ones outside, they're reproducing like rabbits. They're reproducing like cats, right? Mm -hmm. So that problem is just getting worse. And we know that about 70 to 75% of cats that enter our shelters in the United States are getting euthanized. So it begs the question, is it a good idea to take cats into shelters? Well, if you look at the United States and Americans and know how many billions of dollars we spend on our own pets, do you think that people would actually take cats to shelters if they knew that? But as open, I consider myself an open admission girl. We have for too long hid behind a veil of shame because we don't want people to call us murderers and we don't want people to call us killers. So guess what? When you come to intake, come on in. We're just going to take your pets and we're not going to talk about it. We're not going to tell you that they're at risk of euthanasia. And the sad thing about that is many people are just bringing them to the shelter because we've told them that's what you do. And if they knew, they wouldn't make this the first option. People just don't know. So we need to tell them differently that a shelter for a dog and a cat needs to be the last option. So now we have these facts. So why would we take them into the shelter? Well, we shouldn't. And this is not just target zero making up these things. This is Best Friends Animal Society, HSUS, ASPCA, Million Cat Challenge, all the shelter medicine programs at our veterinary schools. We are all saying the same thing. And those large national organizations are putting millions and millions and millions of dollars into this exact program. So our goal is that people take the cats directly to spay neuter, but if the cats come to the shelter, then instead of taking them into the shelter system, right, 0 .00 something percent are reclaimed by their owner, so nobody's going to come get them, chances are. We're saying divert them to spay neuter, ear tips, rabies vaccination, deworming, and put them back to their outside home. Here was my issue way back when I was a public shelter director, but I don't know who's feeding them. And I don't want to put them back in that, you know, area not knowing who's feeding them. And here's the cat. I'm 10 to 12 pounds, and I go to five houses. I get breakfast at one, a snack at the second, lunch at third, right? All you cat people know what I'm talking about. 
talking about? Karen, one of her cats came back with a different collar one time. <laughs> so, right, these cats are like, I'm fine. 26,000 cats have been through this program in Jacksonville alone, and um, less than 1% were too sick or ill or injured to go back out. So these cats, they're doing fine without our intervention. The only thing we want them to stop doing is reproducing, and then all those characteristics that they're doing while they're reproducing, that's all, they just need to stop that. Other than that, they're doing fine without us, right? So they know where their food source and sources are. So this principle goes for open emission shelters or limited emission shelters. And so Karen and I um, teach organizations um, to do this regardless of their policies with cats. Um, and several things happen. So here, let's talk about that guy next door who has four cats. And somebody traps one of his cats and takes it to the shelter and gets euthanized. So those three cats, they're reproducing. And then, you know, a couple years, next year, year after now, I have like 30 cats. Um, nobody's vaccinated against rabies, and they're just continuing to reproduce. And then my neighbor, my other neighbor's taking them in, they're getting euthanized. So nothing, everything is just happening on that hamster wheel at his house. Versus, I helped him with the four cats, and I got the four cats sterilized. And now they're rabies vaccinated, and I've increased community immunity against rabies. Um, so we have an overall decrease in community cats. Um, we don't have that hamster wheel from that location. Now we have less wildlife at risk. We have less zoonotic potential between rabies and parasite transmission, because we have less cats. We don't want cats outside. We want every cat to like sleep on somebody's pillow at night. But that's not a realistic goal. People will always lend their cats in and out, and people will always feed cats outside, period. So we're saying, let's decrease the number. Let's actually, here's a crazy idea, let's come up with a solution. Instead of just over and over trapping and euthanizing and not dealing with a, a solution. So now what happens in the shelter is really amazing. And it's a game changer. And if you're here tonight because you only care about dogs, you should support community cat diversion. And that is because, holy cow, you keep all these cats out of the shelter, so you have more time for dogs. You can have sort of prevention <coughs> programs for dogs. You can have enrichment. They have more room. They have more space. They have more staff dedicated to them. So this is a great program for cats and dogs but it eliminates the unnecessary euthanasia of cats, period. So this is any outside cat that comes into the shelter, friendly or feral, he goes back to his outside home. Some shelters say to us, oh, well, this one is really nice, so we kept him for adoption. And then we had somebody actually ask us, as a shelter worker, um, what if, yeah, but what would we do if we didn't have cats in the shelter? And so I was, clearly you can tell I am not speechless often. Um, and I'll just give you the partial list. Let's um, pop champagne, walk a dog, um, have a party, celebrate. I mean, why would we want, do we want children in foster care? No. We don't, why do we want cats in shelters? We want to stop cats from coming in the shelter. But in any event, what happens is the cats that do enter, right, are your owner surrenders, the ones that have never been outside. Those are the cats you take into your adoption program. They get adopted like they have wings. And our shelters that are doing this, um, when we um, sometimes go back and um, visit them, there's no cats in the shelter. Or the last time I was in Waco, there were three cats and one was blind, and he got adopted. It's like, when would a blind cat ever get adopted in any shelter? In Indy, we saw this cat in adoptions. He had to be 21 years old, and he got adopted. Like, he didn't have any teeth, but who needs teeth? So um, it, it really is amazing, and it's a game changer for the shelter, for the cats, of course, um, and for the dogs. Some or some communities need to have ordinance changes, so we 
do help with that, and we have been successful. Every time we've attempted to um, change ordinances, um, we recommend that ACOs um, are, are laser focused on public safety, not on picking up healthy cats in the community. So they need to be dealing with dangerous dogs, with cruelty cases, with neglect, with police cases. That's what our ACOs, that's why you exist as animal control for public safety. So our ACOs need to be focused on public safety and not being a taxi service for healthy cats. So we also love when these programs can be public-private partnerships. Some of our fellows, actually, the, um, the public shelters do the releasing of the cats. Um, others have nonprofits that they work for to put the cats back to their outside home. And if you haven't heard about the Million Cat Challenge, um, I would encourage any of you cat lovers to join. It's free and you can be on a listserv. And there's lots of people all over the country doing these great programs already. And some people will go on and say, hey, we're having this challenge. Is anybody, um, has anybody faced this? And could you give us advice? And then you get advice and vice versa. And you can tell them what you're doing that's working really well. So here's what happened in Jacksonville. So you can see in 07, 08, 10,703 cats lost their lives that year in shelters in Jacksonville. So the spay neuter clinic, at the time, it was um, the, uh, a couple directors ago, um, the spay neuter clinic director said, you're euthanizing these ear chip cats that we already sterilized and spent money on, so why can't you give us the cats because we know where they, you know, we'll put them back where they were found because they're already sterilized. And so the animal control director said, well, if it's good enough for the ferals, why don't you take all of them? And so um, the director, who didn't have statistics and accurate data, said to Cameron, it's only going to be a couple of cats a day and you're going to deal with it. So animal control said, that's fine, but we don't want to take any complaint calls. We don't want to deal with the public. So we're going to give Cameron's personal cell phone to everybody. Cameron was shaking in her shoes. She thought she was going to be snipered in the parking lot. And so, as if she didn't have enough to worry about that and people having her personal cell phone, 5,400 cats that year came through that first year when Cameron expected, what did you expect, like 100, 200? We, no, I think we expected like 1,300. So you expected because, 1300. because we were relying on the data from the shelter, that wasn't accurate. That wasn't accurate, <laughs> yeah. So over 5,400 cats. So how many calls do you think Cameron got? A lot. You think Cameron got a lot of calls? Who thinks Cameron got a lot of calls? Cameron got 12 calls. 5,400 plus cats. And here's the cool thing about this. We have so many, hundreds and hundreds of communities doing this all over the country, and guess what? Every one of these communities had many thousands of cat complaints, and then they do this program, cricket, cricket, cricket. <laughs> Everywhere. The cat complaint calls disappear because you've given people a solution. And so you see that big jump in live outcome. And again, note, in these next several slides, these organizations did not get to 90% because their live outcome, I mean, except for that first year, shot up. They got to 90% because there was such a drastic decrease in intake and euthanasia. So, so the bottom is uh, live release, and the top darker bar is euthanasia. But note the decrease in intake over time. Two reasons. The neighbor doesn't have any more cats to bring in. His cat for the original four are sterilized. So that guy has nothing else to do. So now he can go watch Bonanza. <laughs> so I just dated myself probably. I like older than I loved. Um, and then number two is this is the culture in Jacksonville and these other communities. They all started where Lafayette Parish is, right? I don't know what an narrative cat is. Now, holy cow, I landed in Jacksonville and the Avis guy gives me a dissertation on what an ear tip cat means. <laughs> like this is the culture in Jacksonville. And it starts with the animal welfare, 
um, people, the shelter, educating one at a time, and this stuff works. So this is Indianapolis. Um, you can see their live outcome. They, we started this program here. You can see the jump in live outcome in 2013, but the same <coughs> decrease in intake over time. So that's because it's the culture in the community. They're going to bypass the shelter, go to spay neuter, and put the cats back where they came from. Or like Karen tells the story that you know they'll go to return cats, and then somebody will run out and be like, "Hey, where's my Fluffy? He didn't come back yet." You know, so they they know that if Fluffy's missing and he wasn't ear tipped, chances are you know he could be getting spay neutered, um, and. People are actually happy about it. One woman, I think, she thought like some she called an abuse case then because somebody cut her cat's ear off <laughs> and like shaved him and she couldn't figure it out. And then she was so happy to have her cat back. She didn't know to sterilize them. Maybe she didn't have the money to sterilize, but she was happy to have her cat back. But again, this is the culture now in these places. So here's Waco when we started. They were euthanizing over 2,000 cats. And again, you can see the decrease. Look at their live outcome. Didn't go up that much. And what happened is the overall intake and therefore the euthanasia decreased in a very drastic ways. In Huntsville, they started this program in the middle of 2014. The reason cat intake has decreased over these years, remember, this is the community that's been doing fixed income subsidies for spay neuter. They have a nonprofit that does that with their local private veterinarians. Okay, so the next section is surrender prevention. Some of you might have heard this call, um, be called safety net. And so here's the thing. Um, again, we have all these fancy studies, and um, this is the latest one from Emily Weiss that came out. Um, and they found that a third of the people surrendering to shelters didn't want to surrender, they just needed some sort of short-term help. So this is a very interesting, over um, a million <coughs> rehomed every year. So the other interesting survey that came out in 2015 is that our open admission shelters need the most help but are the least likely to ask, right? We're hiding behind this veil. Um, too afraid to tell anybody that we need help. And the second thing this survey showed was that when Good Samaritans come to the shelter with potential fosters like kittens or puppies, that um, if we offered to do the spay neuter, um, the vaccines when they're old enough, they're most likely to help. So when a Good Samaritan brings those puppies or kittens, they think they're doing the right thing because we have told them, when you find a puppy or a kitten or a dog or a cat, you take it to a shelter. Um, the reason maybe that Good Sam wouldn't want to foster is because they can't handle the um, spay neuter and the responsibility of the vaccines, but when you offer that help to them, they are likely to help or more likely to help. And that keeps those babies out of the sheltering system. And we also want to empower our foster families to place um, those babies um, outside the shelter system as well. So surrender prevention, again, goes along with income-targeted spay-neuter. <laughs> this is a far more impactful um, program than the reactive program of trying to save shelter animals. Um, and I think that it's really now, uh, the, 2000, the last several years, um, this is now the vote. This is what funders and best friends and a lot of the major funders are looking at to fund because we now know that there are very simple ways that we can help keep animals out of shelters. We want to see what those pet owners need and see if we can help them keep their pets or give them some sort of a network to place the pets on their own. Managed intake, we recommend for even public shelters. We <coughs> want to make sure um, that we have hours um, for intake that are lower than our live outcome hours. And we can do that if we schedule, for example, owner surrenders 
Um, I, in my <coughs> opinion, I don't think public shelters should take owner surrenders because I think about, um, so if I, if my car broke down, I would call the mayor's office and say, um, you need to come tow my car at your own expense. Why is it okay for us to let pet owners leave their animals in a public shelter? I think that's crazy. Um, so we want to help them place their pets outside of the system, outside of the shelter system, but managed intake could mean you have specific hours for owner surrenders and even strays. Maybe you um, have a, a fee, which I definitely agree with. Owner surrendering animals surrendered to a shelter should be charged. Um, the shelter then bears a lot of expense to care for that animal. So we need to think about these things. We are still going to help these people. We're not slamming the door and saying, good luck, you're on your own. We're saying, help us help you. So when we say live outcome or live release or save rate, we're talking about these different avenues. So return to owner is the same as reclaim, adoptions, transport or transfer. LOS is shorter length of stay. So if an animal does come into a shelter, we are focused on how can we get them out alive as soon as possible. What, what barrier, if, are there any barriers that we're putting up ourselves that we could um, change so that we can get them to live outcome sooner, rescue and foster. So those are all our live outcome options. So reclaiming, we want, it starts in the field with our ACOs. We want to make sure our ACOs are powered and equipped to return um, those animals with ID or even, um, you know, any way that they can possibly return animals that are strayed. We, um, we hosted a great webinar about a community-minded animal approach to animal control given by the president of the National Animal Control Association and in his community he designated one ACO um, once a week their job was to be on the ground in those high intake areas interacting with people and figuring out what those pet owners needed because he was just tired of going in the same neighborhoods and seeing the same dogs and then seeing the offspring of those dogs, right? So by doing this, um, and really instead of being punitive and having an enforcement-minded approach every single day, writing a citation that still doesn't fix the problem, they really enabled their staff to help. They got in-kind donations, they gave away colors and leashes and tags and so that the people, the pets had identification, they helped repair fences, there was all kinds of things that people needed. And they turned that, those high intake areas into low intake areas. Just by that simple step, not even all their staff, just people rotating through this um, community minded approach to animal welfare. So open adoptions, um, I have a, uh, What's it called? A prop. <laughs> I'm a prop because um, I was so excited when this came out. This is HSUS's Adopters Welcome. It's a guideline that just came out in 2015. So I would encourage you all to go home on animalsheltering.org. You can download it for free and print it at home, or you can order this book for $10. I don't get any proceeds from this. I just think it is a great, amazing wealth of information that really dispels all the myths we have about adoptions. So one of the things that's in this book that you'll find is that there are 144 million amazing families and pet owners in the United States and dogs are sleeping on beds, pushing their owners off the bed with their head on the pillow, right? Um, that's the majority of people here. That's, that's really the reality. But when we're in animal welfare, and we're in animal control, and we're in our open emission shelters, we see otherwise, do we not? We see the worst of the worst, we see the neglect, we see the hoarders, we see the abandonment, we see the abuse. And so that's about eight million or so, six, six to eight million, right? But boy, when you come to my shelter and adopt, I'm thinking you're that six to eight million. Yeah. We're forgetting 
We're forgetting the most, most of the people that are coming to our shelters are good people that can be trusted. And we need to get out of our own way. So one of the, the first things we need to realize is we need to make the right match. We're the experts. We have these animals. We know their personalities. We want to make sure we're making the right match for that pet and that family. Hands down, number one, I hope everyone hears me because at the end, sometimes I get questions. I'm going to repeat that. The goal is to make the right match because at the end of this presentation, we have had the question, you just want to get rid of animals? No. That is not what we're saying. We're saying we want to make the right match. But we also know that we cannot use high adoption fees to screen a good pet owner, period. So if, if you, and think about yourself, if you paid, which nobody in this room would pay $5,000 for a dog and a breeder, right? Nobody. Um, but you did. And then you found a dog in the street for free. So are you going to love, which one are you going to love more? You're going to love them the same. So we can't use an adoption fee as a screen for what we might judge a good home. The second thing is that we cannot use adoption fees as a, a, re, a revenue source that we are depending on for our organization to exist. So we need to figure out how we're going to raise money other ways. When we lower the adoption fees and even fee weight, I mean, if you go on any of the national um, websites, Maddie's Fun, ASPCA Pro, you're going to read all about this. Fee waived adoptions is good, especially for cats, right? We have the most competition for cats because they usually just adopt us on the street. Um, and then um, low adoption fees, meaning, you know, no more than $35 or so, and that means you're including the sterilization, the vaccines, and all those things. Um, but I really encourage you all to go um, read this, the guidelines, because there's all these great studies and information and things that will make you feel um, better about maybe looking at opening adoptions because we um, want to remove barriers. We want to make sure that we're educating that person into being a good pet owner, and then they're going to come back to me as the resource when they have any questions or problems or issues with that adoption. <coughs> so say somebody comes to you to adopt, but they never, they had a dog and they didn't sterilize them. Oh boy, shh, shh. deny, right? <laughs> so instead, okay, say you deny them, but he really wants a dog, so they go adopt a dog, from their neighbor's backyard that is not sterilized, probably not, will not be sterilized and won't be vaccinated, so you'll get the puppies um, in your shelter. What we're saying is, this is an opportunity for you to say, here's why spay and neuter is important. We're not going to adopt a dog to you unless it's spayed and neutered, and this is why it's healthier for them, and this is why it's the best thing, and yada, 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 and now you placed a sterilized, vaccinated pet with that person. So it's about creating a good pet owner and working alongside them and leaving our judgments and our fears behind and creating a good relationship with people and then having them use you as the resource. Rescue groups are such an important part of that 90% light outcome for so many reasons. We need to have, I mean, say for our open admission shelters that are using um, our, with rescue group partnerships, certainly we want to have an approval process and they should be 501c3s and obviously caring for the animals appropriately and getting them adopted quickly. Um, these same open adoption philosophies are for everybody. Open admission, limited admission, rescue groups, they're for everybody. The quicker a rescue group or limited admission shelter can place a pet in the right home, the more they can take from the open admission shelter and everybody gets saved. The longer a, a group, any kind of group, holds a pet, think about your community. 
Try to think of yourselves as one big shelter in Lafayette. And the more you save, the quicker you save, the more you can save the ones that are at risk because they can't be kept long term at the open admission shelter. So we love when there's, um, we do recommend no fees for pulling because the rescue groups are such an important part of that live outcome and they can decrease the length of stay, get those animals out as soon as possible. So we do recommend a first come first serve um, to get animals out as quickly as possible. Length of stay is bad. Um, it, it means that, you know, I think people who met well um, created these stray holes. Like sometimes they're excessive. There's some places that are seven days and that was, those decisions were made um, with the right intentions. They wanted to make sure that people would find their pets. But what it does, it, it kind of backfired and the majority of those pets are not being reclaimed by their owners and it simply has exposed shelter pets to more infectious diseases. Um, so we do believe in um, a, a shorter um, stray hold, like five or three to five days for dogs, preferably three. And then for cats, what I didn't mention in this section about community cats is there is no stray hold because you're waiting for 0.001%, right? And you know they're gonna go home, you're returning them to their outside home. So we do not recommend a stray hold for cats. And those cats that are going back all should be ear checked so they're identified as sterilized and rabies vaccinated. And then foster care um, obviously goes without saying. We want to empower our foster families. Again, open philosophy, open adoption philosophy, get them adopted into the right homes and have them fill up all their family and friends because if we don't do that, now we've created a second intake. So we've actually increased our intake. We need to think about utilizing all these animal lovers in our communities. And some people actually prefer to have foster, be foster volunteers instead of having pets permanently. <coughs> now kitten nurseries um, is at the very top of our pyramid, and I just have the numbers from Jacksonville up here. But we, Jacksonville's actually changing their philosophy, but I'll tell you the beginning of the story. There's not that many nurseries around. There's one in Salt Lake, Austin, Jacksonville, so they're kind of sprinkled. Um, this was a collaborative effort between the Humane Society, First Coast Normal, Normal Homes Pets, and the city shelter who graciously donated all the kittens. And this was um, year one. They saved 652, and then you can see the numbers that they saved after that. This was after their foster homes were full, they went into the kitten nursery. Now what they found was they really struggled with control of infectious disease, again, because we're sheltering animals. So we have a lot of kittens and cats in a, in a small space. It was a little house. Um, so year four, the reason that that number is lower is because um, they started to put those babies in the lobby, right? Because in Jacksonville, it's hard to find a kitten to adopt. And so when they came to the shelter, there's no kittens, but yet they have all these foster babies. So in the lobby, there's all these foster babies. Oh, you came to adopt the kitten? You can pre-adopt this kitten, who is going to be your foster, and how about taking a litter, and then help us place it, and that's what they did. So that is what, and they're in the night, they're 95%, I think this year, 94% um, live outcome for everybody, but they did decrease the number going into their nursery, and they're thinking about not doing the nursery now. So these are things that we hear about, and there's, you know, um, there, there might be, um, you know, stories in Animal Sheltering Magazine about it, but this was just Jacksonville's story um, and how they opted to evolve, right? They were really big on pilot programs and trying something, and if it doesn't work, we're gonna try something else, but boy, are we gonna keep trying, because we know better now. We didn't have this information before, we know better now. So that's the end of the formal presentation. Um, and I will take questions about our strategies, but really, I um, so appreciate this record-breaking crowd. Thank you.